My sermon text is Isaiah 56, verses 1 and verses 6 and 7. And I don't know what page it's on in the Pew Bible. I always forget to note that. So it's short, maybe. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Here ends the reading of these words inspired by God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. We'll mark the date. I'm doing something with this scripture this evening that I rarely do. I'm taking it as it comes, pretty much, without too much concern over its origins, who wrote it, to whom, or why. I'm going old school, which means no school, as in seminary, to an extent. I could go 20 minutes just framing this passage and explaining the context, but I won't. What I'm going to do here at first is just look at the verses and accept them as the gift that they are and trust God that we'll be able to get something out of it. I remember that that was the standard prayer in Sunday school back in the day when the teacher would surprise one of us boys by asking us to pray before class. So I want to ask you now to just bow with me for that simple prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, Lord, help us get something out of it. Amen. Now, I said I wouldn't go too much into the background, but I have to go a little bit. In a nutshell, the author of this passage, speaking for God, was opening the doors to faith to foreigners, to foreigners, with ways different than their own. Prominent Israelites and their descendants were being allowed to return home to Judah after 40 to 80 years of being held captive by the Babylonians. They were returning to chaos. Strange people were living in the houses that they'd been forced to abandon. The economy was a wreck, and order and stability were things of the past for government and faith. The temple, the center of religious life, was gone. The returning former exiles, upper-class Jews, were clashing with the working class and the poor Jews who had been left behind 40 to 80 years before. Suffice it to say that the ones who never left, after scrambling to make a living and trying to make sense of life all that time, they were none too happy to see these uppity Jews coming back from captivity, expecting to be able to pick up right where they left off. And stuck in that crossfire between the returning Jews and the Jews who had stayed put and barely made do were foreigners, non-Jews who had been drawn into the Jewish way of life, but not necessarily the fine points of Jewish religion. And what did God have to say through the prophet we call Isaiah as they were all figuring out how to get along? The Jews carried off but returning, the Jews left behind, and all those foreigners in that mix, that cultural boiling pot. God said maintain justice and do what's right. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. All peoples, even, even their funny smelling burned offerings, Different because of different worship practices. All peoples, even with their weird ways, their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, God said, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Now, you may think I gave you a whole lot of background there, considering I told you I wasn't going to give you a lot of background, but trust me, the book of Isaiah is a behemoth, and the studies it's prompted, as you know, fill libraries, and I just barely touch the surface. But it's enough. So what can we get out of it? Well, here's what I get. It's that last line in verse 7. God said, For those who come into my love and covenant, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. 
no matter how different they seem otherwise. No matter who you are or where you are on journey with me, God said, you are welcome here with me in my house of prayer. How can God be so open-minded? Because of mainly what prayer is. Prayer, first and foremost, is intimacy with God, whether it's prayer alone in a prayer closet or prayer with others in worship. It's conversation, sometimes, words spoken and those left unsaid. It's familiarity and confidence and trust and honesty, openness, willingness to express anger and lament and dissatisfaction, to shake your fist, as well as faith and hope and love. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5. And John Shelby Spong, the old heretic, I say that lovingly, he fired back at Paul. When St. Paul said that we are to pray without ceasing, he surely did not mean we ought to say prayers without ceasing. When people envision the kingdom of heaven as a place where people are praying all the time, I just as soon not go if that's the reality that you have to deal with. Then Paul says somewhere else in Philippians, Philippians 4, do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Notice that Paul doesn't say to pray to get. I remember when Dolly and I, that's my wife, when Dolly and I moved into our house, 15 years ago, the neighbor's little girl, about 10, came over and announced, Mama's praying for Alexis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, Paul doesn't say pray to get. He says, don't worry. And Paul says that should define the life of Christ. Then pray and be thankful and make your requests and accept the reality of the peace of God, which will guard our minds and our hearts no matter what. Even in the places where Jesus seems to say, pray for this and you'll get it. It's in the context of the life in, it's in the context of the life in Christ, lived to make real the kingdom of God. And that may or may not include getting a new car. So better to pray, Thy kingdom come, than Lord, I want a Lexus. Yeah. <laughs> David Felton and John Proctor Murphy put it like this in their book Living the Questions, The Wisdom of Progressive Christianity. They wrote so pray for healing, not because you'll always get well, but so you connect with the still mysterious and natural power of healing. Pray for safe travel, not because God will necessarily catch your plane, but so that you can be prepared for whatever happens. Pray for the end to a drought, or for a job, or for fill in the blank, not because prayer is going to control the weather, the future employer, or anything else but so you can avoid the temptation to despair of God's goodness in times of difficulty. And they go on, that is acknowledging the reality that life is what it is. There is a time for every matter under heaven, Ecclesiastes says, and right there is the rhythm to being human. Personal experience confirms that the rain falls on both the good and the bad, and don't we know it? So prayer is intimacy with God and with one another. It's not always actual dialogue, although I think it's always communication. We know, although it's easy to forget with the whole world yakking 24-7, that communication takes place without words. And communications without words takes seeing or perception. Praying takes paying attention. And finally, we get to the spiritual practice of Da, da, da. praying with icons. <laughs> Nothing will jump out of this box. This is just a little box that I keep some little personal things in. And this is an icon. So I don't know how to pronounce it. Pantocrator? Pantocrator? Pantocrator. Right. Christ. Pantocrator. Pantocrator. It's got a name and I can't pronounce it. It's a very, it, it's a very familiar, it's, probably the most familiar icon of Christ. And here's one of St. Francis of Assisi. So there are different saints' images, mostly, or scenes from the Bible, or on icons. And I'll get to that one in a minute. 
Now, you may or may not have had an image pop into your mind when I said icon. If you did, I'll bet, I'll bet part of it is, this, is in this official definition by Bradley Hutt. He says, an icon is a painting of a religious figure that serves as a point of contact with the worshiper. It is an object of devotion, not worship, that affirms the incarnation of Christ. Now, I bet if anything came to mind when I said icon, it was a painting of a religious figure. And you might have had something come in your mind about worship, probably the wrong thing, judging from people I know. But I'll bet that affirms the incarnation of Christ may not have come to mind, unless you have an Eastern Orthodox Church background. Those are the, quote, foreigners I'm letting into worship tonight. And they smile at Protestants' misunderstanding of icons. They probably see us as the foreigners. Here's a reality check. Do you remember in the book of Acts, the street called Straight in Damascus? It's Acts says Paul visits it there. Well, today, the Greek Orthodox Church of Antioch, which traces its origins back to Peter and Paul, is headquartered on Straight Street in Damascus. That is so cool. I know that because a friend of mine who's active in the, one of the Orthodox churches in Oklahoma City, and he's been here, and I wanted to touch him. That stuff's real. And they pray with icons. Boy, do they. If you've ever been to an Orthodox church, they often line the walls with big ones, as big as people. They use them in devotions, in prayer, not to worship. They use them, and we can learn to, too, if we want to, to affirm the incarnation of Christ, to provide a tangible thing to help us experience the intangible presence of Christ, to help us pray, to help us find intimacy with God who is always, and we who are not always. Now let's think about that for a minute. There are tangible things all around here that help us experience the intangible presence of Christ. In a few minutes, we will experience the presence of Christ with taste and touch when we share communion. Those are kinds of icons. The Bible is an icon. This laptop computer can be an icon. Hymnals are icons. That beautiful stained glass back there is almost literally an icon. It is a painted, of sorts, image of Christ. And I'm thinking this afternoon, what a shame that when we're in worship we can't see it. <laughs> I see it every Sunday. It is beautiful. And it's a window. And that's important for understanding what icons are. Because the point of icons is to see. The human figures and actual icons are regarded as windows on eternity, means by which we can participate in the divine. Think of it as right brain prayer, using images, not the usual flood of words from the left brain. The Eastern Orthodox express and experience devotion to Jesus and to all the saints, by lighting candles and incense before icons and kissing them. And I remember being startled when I saw that, my friend. Every time he came within reach of an icon, he would kiss it. And he wore, he wore a, an Orthodox rosary. It was, it was very tactile. And I, it was strange to me, but I was jealous of it right at the same time. The Eastern Orthodox, who we consider foreigners, joined themselves to the Lord to minister to him. They love the name of the Lord and to be his saints. They keep the Sabbath. They do not profane it. They hold fast to God's covenant. They're joyful in God's house of prayer. Their worship accepted for God's house is a prayer, a house of prayer for all peoples. And the Orthodox, among the very oldest expressions of the way of Jesus, have preserved these gifts of the great clouds of witnesses who came way before. They've preserved these gifts called icons. We're, we're Americans, and so that means we want to write down a list of things to do. And so I'm going to give you a list of things to do because it's my experience. Don't write it down. Select an icon. Now, ignore the words. This is something I used at Mayflower. This is a, this is a cherished item to me. It's huge. There's no doubt who you're looking at. Select an icon, spend time considering it, what it is. This is paper and ink, but the image is a gift of those who came before. It's a gift as much as the scriptures themselves, as far as I'm concerned. Think of it as a window through which 
you're communing with someone with Christ or another person. In your mind, put yourself on the other side of the window and look at yourself the way Christ sees you, lovingly, with all your warts and all your faults and all your problems. Just contemplate what comes into your mind and into your heart. This is my testimony. I spent time with this image. I put myself on the other side of the window, and after some time, I found myself, and I say it that way because I didn't set out to do this. I found myself contemplating the way Christ sees my wife. I was given a perspective of her that has burned into my heart and mind. I saw her pain. She has chronic pain. I saw her pain the way Christ sees it. I saw her disappointment the way Christ sees it. She's a PhD. She's been grounded from her work and her career. Through Christ's eyes, I saw her hope, her desires, her longings, the way Christ sees them. Not because of any magic in this icon, but because I forgot about words and soaked up the image and I became one with the Christ. And I saw through his eyes in a holy moment that I will never forget. That's why I dare bring these strange things into this church. And that's why I'm trying a little at a time to make the prayer room back here a special place. And that's why I'm doing this series on prayer. I want to see that way regularly. I want that to become part of my spiritual practices, along with Bible devotions and reading and worship and singing. I want to see that way more than I do. And I hope that you all will think about it, trying to see that way. Because prayer is seeing, and prayer does change things. It changes us. Finally, you know, icons are symbols. But they're not, but they're not mere symbols, because they're matter. And no matter is mere matter. It's the fact that icons are things that they are matter that connects praying with them to the incarnation of Christ in the world. In the incarnation, God took a material body, a body of matter, proving that matter can be redeemed. The good news is not just for humankind. We believe that God so loved the cosmos, as the Gospel of John really says, that God gave his only son who came not to condemn matter, but that the whole cosmos, all matter through him, might be saved. God loves matter. God made it. And God infused it with God's self in Christ to redeem it and glorify it. Icons matter. It's much more than looking at pictures. Amen.